Hello and welcome back to Mining Network. I'm with Bruce Griffin, the Executive Chairman of Sheffield Resources. Bruce, good to have you back on the programme. Pleased to be back, Peter. Um, just kick things off, for those, obviously you've done a video with one of your long-term shareholders, Rod, um, a couple of months ago, so people with the channel should be familiar with you, but for those less familiar, just a brief overview of Sheffield. So Sheffield's a mineral sands company um, listed on the Australian Stock Exchange market cap about 200 million Australian dollars and we're developing the Thunderbird project in the far northwest of WA. Okay. And obviously you're about 70%, just over 70% complete in terms of the construction of this now. So we, we're getting into the final, final hurdle in terms of getting into production towards the end of this year. Yeah. Um, before we go into the numbers and, and the new acquisition as well, because we need to touch on that, what, what makes Thunderbird special in terms of the resource, the grade, and, and really the deposit as a whole? What, why was you originally attracted to this? Because it's been quite a quick succession from taking over the asset, finding a partner, and getting this where it is now. Yeah, so I, I first got involved in Thunderbird about three years ago. It had been around for a while, uh, previous management. But what's interesting about that deposit, world's largest zircon reserve um, but it's about 50 percent larger than the next largest asset so it, it means it's globally significant um, it's pretty high grade uh, reasonably challenging mining but with 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 the high grade that that's fine um, it's an old deposit so it needs a little bit more work than some of the younger sand deposits um, but the real attractiveness is this is, is it's the world's largest Zircon Reserve, and that's the largest source of revenue. But then it also has uh, attractive um, uh, minerals, uh, titanium minerals, and even a small amount of rare earths revenue as well. So, um, yeah. Okay, and just for those less, obviously, it's not like gold or copper where <laughs> these things are traded yeah. quite. A, this is a very niche market. What can maybe just give us a bit of an idea of what Zircon used for? What does the global market shape up like at the moment? Yeah, so Zircon, uh, it's um, w w the way I always think about mineral sands is they're the smallest of the bulks. So, you know, it's not a they're not speciality materials, but you know they're not hundreds of millions of tons. So, Zircon is around about uh, between one and one point two million tons a year global uh, demand. Uh, largest markets China and Europe. Um, biggest applications. Uh, the largest one overall is ceramics. So zircon is used if effectively. The way to think about it is, if you think about a ceramic tile or a you know, piece of uh, um, sanitary ware like a like a basin, what makes it um, white and 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 glow or glossy is the zircon. So that that's about, I think about a third of, if not a little bit more, probably a little bit more of of overall global zircon demand. Then Zircon also has uh, some good attributes from uh, uh, for, for um, use in foundry applications. So uh, it's used for casting. So you can make it for, for molds, for casting metals. Uh, there's some applications for refractory. So Zircon can be used for making refractory linings. And then there's a number of sort of smaller uses which where Zircon's used in, to make chemicals. So it's used in some chemical applications. So that's sort of how to think about how to think about Zircon. Um, probably the last piece is what's it worth. There's always yeah. a question people would like to know. Um, Zircon in recent years has typically traded in the sort of two thousand dollar a ton type range, up to two and a half, down to eighteen hundred. Um, there's a view to long term price from from some of the market commentators is sixteen hundred um, US dollars a ton. So it's that sort of value of the of of the commodity. With with the world's largest Zircon reserve going into production, <laughs> I mean. It sounds like with other markets, we saw it in graphite, for example, Syro Resources flooded the market with too much graphite, yep. tanked that market in particular. Is there a risk of a Thunderbird coming in and, and disrupting the market like that? Yeah, I'd say no for a couple of reasons. One, um, actually, our, our scale of production in stage one, uh, which is about 120,000 tonnes. So even if flat out, we're about um, 12% of the world's market. So unlike, say, in graphite, where individual projects can be 100% of the market. And then the other thing is that as we're coming into production, there's a couple of the traditional minerals, uh, Zircon producers, specifically Aluka's Jacinth Ambrosia project in South Australia and uh, Rio Tinto's RBM in South Africa. Um, 
Jacinth Thambrosia is coming to the end of its mine life. And I think at the moment, 25, 26 is the end of mine life. Uh, that's about a third of supply today. So that's a big chunk to fill. Okay. Um, and then with Richards Bay in South Africa, traditionally one of the larger producers has been struggling to maintain production as it gets near the end of life on, on Zulti North. And while until the Zulti South project is committed to, then um, effectively there's no scope for them to increase production. And in fact, they're struggling to maintain and the third large producer, which has been Tronox, uh, again, has been working quite hard to maintain production. So really, without some of these new projects, the, the market will will not be able to replace the gap left by Jacinth Ambrosia. Okay, so it sounds like the gap's a lot larger than the 12% that you're going yeah, to fill in. Correct. Right. <laughs> um, how many other projects are out there that could be filling this gap? Or are we going to be seeing a, a quite a tight market where we could see some price fluctuation in in the in the green for for you guys yeah i mean it, it other projects there is a project uh actually just started up in australia called uh strandline um resources started up their coburn project um that's about fifty thousand tons of zircon uh, that's sort of it for new projects what you find is there tends to be most new mineral sands projects will have some zircon but the the proportion of zircon in, in, in Thunderbird is much higher than, than than a typical project. So what you what you often find is that even though the project might there might be an ilmenite project out there somewhere, it's unusual for them to contribute more than 30, 40,000 tons of zircon. So there really aren't a lot of there really aren't zircon projects. There are you know ilmenite projects that have zircon in them. So there, there's not that risk of it's not obvious where the other large new project would come from that could that could also fill that gap. Okay. Um, and so I think the consensus has been that, well, Aluka is man has been managing um, the market as they're getting towards the end of mine life on Jacinth Ambrosia. They've been quite sensibly, when the market is weaker, they've reduced supply, and they'll then sell at you know, higher prices later. So that, they've been doing a pretty good job of sort of m matching supply and demand. I think um, therefore what we've seen is that's why prices have typically tracked above um, long-term, uh, people's long-term expectations. I don't think there's, it's difficult to see where the sudden oversupply comes from. Uh, even if there's a little bit of drop in demand, then typically what we've seen is a local will just adjust their supply to match that. So. Okay. Good. And I'm just, I'm just even thinking even more long term here, because obviously it's such a <laughs> long, long term. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, it's, it's such a, a tight market in terms of the amount of producers mm. in this space. And someone like yourself is opening one mine, obviously, granted, the largest zircon mine in the world uh, or reserve in the world um, gets you to 12 percent. And that's just on the, the first. Is that first that's stage one only? Yeah. Stage one. And then where do you get up to stage two? Uh, stage two would be um, about 50, 60 percent more than that. So that would take us uh, at another um, 60,000 tons, say. So somewhere around 180, 200,000 tons would be a reasonable sort of expectation. So around 18 percent. So of... about 18 percent of the current market. Right. So and if, if the Lucas resource reserves are reducing, Rio are having issues with theirs, I mean, You've also just acquired a new asset we're going to go on to, but mm. there is a pathway here for you to be, if if not one yeah. of the dominant player in the Zircon market and, and sort of have that control that Luca has at the moment in terms of being able to reduce supply. Do you, yeah. do you think that's a... Y y yes and no. I mean, I think definitely we we certainly have a constructive view on, on mineral sands and Zircon, um, yeah, clearly the things we're doing. Um, we would be one of the largest, if not the largest, supplier potentially. And you know, if we take a stage two view, and the new asset we've acquired was in production, th that would definitely make us a larger producer. Um, certainly, it would put us in a position where we would be a, a, a leader in that market. Uh, probably the distinction: it, it may not be as easy to control match production to supply as readily as Aluka has, because the reality is, Jacinth Ambrose is a very unusual asset. It's very, very high zircon content, very few other products. So effectively, they can make zircon decisions. We, we would always be having to balance the ilmenite, the other minerals that are in the deposit. But the reality is, is that you can make decisions to, for example, target maybe slightly lower grade areas or, or whatever. So you can definitely, around the edges, try and make sure you match supply to demand as, as much as possible. OK, let's just look at the economics of Thunderbird to begin with. Yep. Um, talk us through stage one because you've, you've, I think you've now released a breakdown of stage one and stage two. Yes, we of, have. Yeah. So maybe 
just as an update, you could run us through what stage one looks like. Yeah, so stage one is what we're building now. Um, as we noted before, it's over 70% complete. Um, stage one is uh, an initial, uh, it's about a, um, a 10 million ton a year mining operation. Uh, then processing, uh, fairly simple processing. Effectively, all we're doing is separating the ore, f the heavy mineral from the from the from the waste, uh, and then splitting that into a few concentrate streams. Uh, producing three three products. We've already talked about zircon concentrate. We produce uh, a magnetic concentrate which contains the ilmenite which our partner takes, and we can come back and talk about that. And then we'll produce a third product, which we call a Paramag, which is a bit of a mixed concentrate that um, people will buy to process. Our all-up capital uh, for this current stage, CapEx, actually true CapEx, um, we've recently split out our um, pre our pre-development operating cost from our pre-development capex. We're looking at a capex number of about 350 million, uh, another uh, 70 million to get into production. Uh, and then when you take into account all of the other things you have to fund, we're, we're looking at um, something around uh, 484 million as our total funding available for stage one. That Those are all Australian. Okay numbers. Good. And you are fully funded. That's we are that. fully funded. Yeah. So the 484 we've funded, um, we have two debt facilities, um, simple terms, 50-50, half from the Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund, uh, state body in Australia, designed national body to fund projects in the north. Uh, that includes a cost overrun facility. And then we have a 110 million US dollar facility from Orion Resource Partners. If you put those two together, that's more or less 315 million Australian dollars at the exchange rates assumed. We put the debt in place. And then the equity uh, balances equity, most of which came from our from our partner. So as we stand, we're fully funded at 70% complete. We still have a, a significant amount of unspent um, uh, cost overrun contingency type allowances, I think in the order of 30 million dollars with with less than 100 million left uncommitted unpriced so we feel very confident that 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 we were funded through to through to production and once you are in production so that's coming up end of this year right end of 20 yeah we're, we're saying commissioning in the first fourth quarter of this year and then first customer deliveries in the first quarter of 2024 good okay so what's what are we looking at in terms of once you're up and running what's the what sort of returns are we looking at what, what? yeah i mean Measured a few ways. Um, we've obviously got a. We've got debt to repay. Um, so very, the project's very robust. It generates significant amount of cash. So, using base case pricing. Um, obviously, the debt is always based on low prices. So, uh, in, but when you run base case prices through, we expect the debt to be repaid within three years, and that's actually one hundred percent of the debt, both Orion and NAIF, um, Even though the debt is longer tenor than that, um, the there'll be sufficient, there'll be surplus cash generated as well. So in theory by, I think, uh, late 2025 um, or second half of 2025, the the Thunderbird um, company, Kimberley Mineral Sands, which we own half of, should be in a position to start generating cash returns for its shareholders. Um, the way to think about it longer term is our, our share of free cash coming out of stage one uh, is sort of in the order of 100, 120 million Australian dollars a year for 50%. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty pretty robust uh, cash generation. Uh, in terms of traditional metrics, it turns into a stage one MPV for 100%. It's about 840 million Australian dollars. So our share, just over 400 million. Uh, IRRs, 27%. I just want to go into, obviously, we're mentioning the 50% here. Yeah. And I just want to yeah, give people important. a yeah. bit of context as to why <laughs> yeah. that is. So, obviously, Jan still came in as a partner. They not yeah. only gave you funding, but also the offtake. Yeah. Um, obviously, that gave confidence for the rest of the funding and really for you to get to where you are now. Maybe you could talk about the partner, the offtake yeah. agreement, and, and how that all worked. Yeah. It, it, it was a very important, um, it was one of the keys to making the project work. So, Jan Steel is a privately owned uh a Chinese steel company. Um, they they produce about ten million tons a year of of of, of steel. So it's a significant enterprise. Uh, when I say privately owned, I'm um, truly privately owned. It's actually three individuals. Uh, so 
that 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 has some advantage. I've had a lot of experience um, doing business with Chinese company, and and the Chinese private companies are actually um, you know, relatively straightforward to work with. Um, they they took the view that it's kind of interesting because they're a steel company. They're not a they're not a traditional mineral sands customer. Um, like a lot of steel companies in China, they recognise that the steel industry is really post growth in China now. You know, that the scope for continuing to grow there is, and I think. Um, Another common feature in China is actually opportunities for investment are relatively limited. You know, it's not a stock market, banks, and so on. So what you often see is these private individuals, they actually trust themselves to reinvest the money, and they identified that titanium was a favoured sector. Um, it doesn't have a strong state um, player in it, and that it was an opportunity they could get into it. And so they uh, formed a view that they wanted to become a pigment producer, and they wanted to vertically integrate. So they came looking for a feedstock partner. And so they identified, um, well, as Sheffield as it was then and the Thunderbird project as being a pretty good match for them. Um, for us, what, what it also meant is that they're actually building a facility that allows them to take ilmenite from different places and actually treat it and make sure it works well in their smelter. And um, that actually enabled us to invest less capital because we could actually um, use, they could do some of the processing and do it in a way where our market risk was minimized because we knew they were building the facilities. So we saw them as a good partner. The, 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 the structure of the deal we did with them was um, they came in, they acquired 50% of the project for cash. They actually injected cash up front. And one of the things that enabled us to do is to keep building the project while we were funding. It was about 130 million Aussie dollars they put in up front, um, a an offtake for 100% of the magnetic concentrate. So they've secured, you know, it's good offtake. It's about 30% of our revenue, and it's the product that would be the most difficult for us to sell. So it was a good a good solution. So they've essentially, they've, they've lowered your capex by having the, their own facilities that you'll yep. be able to process through. Yep. They've given you the offtake and they've also upfront payment. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, with the Zircon, obviously they're not taking the Zircon by no. the sounds of it. How easy is it to sell Zircon? Well, well, obviously you've got a lot of experience in this yeah. industry, yeah. so I'm hoping you'll, you'll yeah. have the contacts, but have there already offtakes agreed? Is that in process? What, what can we expect? Yeah, so we, we're actually selling Zircon concentrate. So Zircon in a concentrate, not, not final product zircon we have contracts in place for 75 percent of that material with three we call them processes in china so one of the things that's happened in the mineral sands industries over the last 10 years is that in china in particular whereas traditionally um, people sold final product zircon and then they used it what what happened in china is these companies uh, emerged who basically buy concentrate and then extract the valuable minerals and sell them to the end users in China. And um, that sector's actually grown to the point where the concentrate market is larger in China now than final product Zircon. So there's, a, and actually across the mineral sands, concentrate's the main source of imports. So we have contracts with other Chinese companies to take 75% of those uh, concentrates. We have some unsold as it stands, and we're looking at other options for processing those, including other companies in China, but also potentially elsewhere, elsewhere in the world. Good. Okay. Well, let's let's move on to the the new acquisition in Brazil yep. because I think this this sort of fits nicely into this theme of Thunderbird will be in production by the end of this year. You'll be making very good cash flows in twenty twenty four. Um, there's a growth story here, and I guess the Brazil asset. What attracted you to it, and and really yep. where do you see this fitting in in terms of your overall growth plans? Yeah. So. Probably the best way to think about Brazil is in the context of the way we now think about Sheffield. So uh, when I first joined, the, the the whole focus was, you know, let's make Thunderbird work. Let's turn it into a real project, get it funded, get it built. But then, so when we talk about that as a, as, as a board, um, we considered a number of things about the way the mineral sands market works in our own business. In terms of our own business, one of the things we were we were thinking about is, as, as you know, Thunderbird's a fantastic asset. It's going to generate a lot of cash, but ultimately, um, it, it's in a 50-50 joint venture. You know, the future growth, while there's great growth options there, um, stage two expansion and, and, and a bigger resource, ultimately, that depends on working with others. And so 
we thought a little bit about you know control of our own destiny and things like that and then when we look at mineral sands one of the things in mineral sands you see is that there's a number of players who have one asset in one country and while australia is a great country to have one asset in people have struggled to sort of get from their first development asset into production and then building a a, a multi-asset business and we took the view that sometimes that's because they wait too long before they look for that next opportunity and then it, it, it becomes hard to capture. And also because we have a non-operate, effectively the joint ventures run as a separate business, we, we don't have to run it day to day. So we have the capacity to look at other things. We also decided that we'd focus on mineral sands. We, we see mineral sands as a, a couple of things. It's got, it's got attractive um, uh, market dynamics for, for zircon. We didn't talk about uh, ilmenite and titanium minerals, but they have a similarly constructive outlook, and we know a lot about it. The, the reality is very experienced in the space. Um, we, there's a lot of knowledge there, and so, and also we recognise there were other assets that a bit like Thunderbird, the potential existed to, to you know, to, to do a similar thing again. Um, specifically, the, the asset in Brazil. Um, what we've negotiated there is an option. Uh, to acquire initially a 20% interest, but ultimately we have a pathway to, to own 100% of that asset. Um, and what attracted um, us to it is while at the moment we, we, we only have expiration targets and so on, we, we see that as um, being a world scale asset. It, it certainly, uh, you know, in the hundreds of millions of tons of resource and, and, and so on, and, and they're pretty rare in mineral sands. Um, all the indications are the product quality Will, will, will be very good. So it's an opportunity to have another really good sort of company making type asset. And when we look at the Zircon specifically, um, again, Zircon quality looks really good. And um, the, the Brazil market is interesting because there's actually, in fact, Brazil's the second largest tile market in the world. Uh, behind China. So there's actually a very large market for Zircon in China. And the only domestic supplier has recently, um, the miners run out of life, which was Mataraca in the north of Brazil. So what's happened historically, it has always been a premium for Zircon in Brazil because imports are subject to duties and so on. So we also see that there's the potential to sell Zircon at a premium to or effectively capture that premium pricing because we'll be producing in, in Brazil. Okay. So big market for Zircon. Big market for, well, and uh, big market for tiles. It's not a massive market globally. There's not a huge uh, tile Zircon loading there, but the, the market for Zircon in Brazil is commensurate with how much we could produce. So potentially you could sell 100% of the product within, within Brazil. Okay. And I just want to touch on the infrastructure of this project as well. Yeah. Because what, I, what I loved when I was looking over it was you, the mineralization goes into the port. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, yeah. logistically, this, this is a dream. It, it's kind of interesting because I've said this to a few people. Um, you know, when you go to this project, uh, it, it's almost you have to see it to believe it. You, 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 you go to Rio Grande and you realize there's actually... Um, there's actually a large container facility. There is large grain. It's one of the largest uh, soy bean export ports in, in, in Brazil. So you have this massive shipping infrastructure. And as you say, we have this sort of 80 kilometer long uh, deposit that actually ends at, at the port. So from an infrastructure build out, there's an expectation that um, you know, power is probably coming from grid. There might need to be a little bit of transmission, but you have a port. We're, we're, we're unlikely to have to invest in a port. Um, the public roads are suitable for moving product on and so on. So the capital investment will likely be focused on building mine and process plant rather than ancillary things. And that that makes a big difference. You know, in a you know, in a greenfields project, in a green for a greenfields project where there is no infrastructure, you know, up to 50% of the capital investment is going to be in infrastructure. So that that's a big advantage. So this I just want to talk about this deal. So you've You've got 18 months, essentially, to, yeah. to option this 20%. Yeah. What work do you need to do to be confident that it is the right decision and you will invest the, the capital to, to yeah. take over? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of things here. We were conscious that we wanted to try and match our sort of spend on these new opportunities with what we're doing at Thunderbird. So we weren't looking for something where we were going to go and you know, write a check for $100 million before we've you know created it. Um, what, what, I mean, I'm very familiar with the project. It's 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 one that I've I've looked at a couple of times and, and with various hats on. And 
Um, there's a fairly clear set of sort of de-risking activities that occur. While there's been a lot of historical work, the reality is it needs, there's, there's a bit of work required to produce a JORC 2012 uh, compliant resource. Um, confident it's there, but ultimately you need to do the work. Probably limited re-drilling, it's more about um, re-analysis of historical results. Uh, we definitely do, uh, and us with the existing owner. So there's actually some money in the company already. So um, we will be spending money together on this. It's not only our money. Uh, they will run the programs, but under our joint supervision. So the plan is Jork Resource, uh, they'll complete a feasibility study um, on, on the, um, uh, for their concept of development. We ultimately might choose to do something different, but that's a, a sort of good basis to value the, or to work out the value of the deposit. Uh, it's quite advanced in permitting. Um, they have a, a, Brazil permitting uses slightly different terms, but effectively they have what's called an LP, which is a preliminary license. Uh, that, that's the main environmental license. And then what, we, what we're doing is um, they're going through the process now of getting an installation license, and that should be granted well within the 18 months, and then a mining decree, which means that the first stage of the project would be permitted, which is a development in the south. Um, those are probably the main the main de-risking. The other thing we've done, or th th that will be done, is some, some a, a, a mining trial. In fact, some work was done um, around about the time we were uh, sorting out the transaction with them, uh, where in parts of the deposit, we, they actually had got some equipment and got some excavators and, and so on, and actually we dug a couple of trial pits to see how the, how the material would mine and to form a view on a mining method, particularly in the north of the deposits where the deposit becomes uh, a little bit thinner. And based on that, you know, fairly confident that there's a viable mining method for that. The south of the deposit looks very much like a dredge deposit. It sits at surface, shallow water table, free digging sand. So that's got you know, dredge written all over it, basically. <laughs> so, so essentially, we could get to a point in eighteen months' time where it's de-risked quite substantially in terms of permitting and metallurgical yeah. test work in terms of whether or not you will be able to process. Yeah. Um, so all things go well, and I, again, I, I know it's really difficult when you talk to exec chairmen or, or CEOs <laughs> about too far in advance because you need to you need to see yeah. what the results are first. But all, all things being well, you get the permits. The the other processing work looks positive. You take the twenty percent on. What's the pathway then? Yeah. What work do you need to do, and what's the pathway to get eighty percent and one hundred percent of the asset? Yeah. So, so the idea is we would then um, the tw two and a half we're putting in over the project. It's only one million on close, but we'll put two and a half in in this eighteen months, or up to that. Then we would put twelve and a half in for the next stage to earn the twenty percent. It'll be. Uh, I think the initial payment is, um, I think it's five million uh, at, at as we exercise the option, and then what would happen then is that and we these, have these numbers are in th these are all US dollars, US dollars because the assets in in, in Brazil, Brazil. Uh, and the idea there is that money. What what we envisage is there'd probably be an optimization phase. There'd be an initial phase where we get in, and now that we know it's our project uh, effectively, then we would. Then do probably some reoptimization on the on the feasibility study, and basically when that's done, uh, that then we'd go for financing. Uh, we would be um, putting together a funding package for it, and then the expectation is uh, that we we would have a path where effectively through funding the project, ultimately we we could end up with 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 a hundred percent with some options at the end just to take care of any sort of uh, the small residual position. So, and I think it'd be good to talk about the partner because we've got a very high quality partner there, but the idea is that we get, we work together to bring the project into production. Uh, we, we will fund, but they they will stay there and effectively they will earn out as, well, let's, as we let's, earn in. Let's yeah. talk about the partner. Who are, who are they? Yeah. What, what gives you confidence um, that, yeah. that they're the right people to work with you on this? So, so there's a few things. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a private company, uh, private Brazilian company, uh, family owned. Uh, they have, as a family, a track record over about 40 years of doing effectively doing similar things. What what they do is they, they typically originate projects in Brazil, they find a foreign industry partner, they work together, and then ultimately 
they exit and the partner takes them takes it out and you know there's some good examples you know our resources is one i think yamana gold is one of theirs originally so you know it's it's kind of they've got an interesting track record of of doing this kind of thing um i i have actually now known them for for quite a while so i've built up um some understanding of who they are and the way they work and 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 you know they feel like the, the, the right sort of partner and they're staying in with us I think there's always that thing that it's not a we'll take your money and and good luck you know we're putting the money in the ground they're staying in as the partner and they really only get their return if we get our return as well so you know our interests are aligned well I guess that's right isn't it because you get the 20% which is the upfront payment yep. but then and the payment is going into the ground so none the ground. of the money we spend is going to the existing owners yep. until we get through uh, the buyouts are all at the back end. So effectively, as long as all of our money will go in the ground and they will really only get a return if, 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 it if it's a production. real project and it can go all the way through to production. At each stage, we have the option to stop. So, you know, we could do the 20%. And if we concluded at that point that we didn't want to move forward, then we could stop. Um, and we could hold our twenty percent. We have some ability for them, for example, to buy us back out. You know, so that we, we, the, the idea is we've got a sort of the, the, you've got some off ramps, but effectively we have a path to one hundred percent, provided we like the project and want to keep going. What what can you? And I know it's very hard at this point because of the resource on the work that's been done on it in the past isn't up to current 2020, 2012, um, 2012 standards. So. What can you tell us about potentially the size of it? Is there anything you can tell us about? Yeah, so several hundreds of millions of tons of 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 ore in place. So it can definitely sustain, you know, twenty year mine life is is very very uh, plausible without a uh, large needing at all to be resource and all the resource to be converted to reserves would be and my it, expectation. It appears at the moment that the zircon's fairly high grade as well, right? Yeah, the the zircon based on. The, the the work we've seen it 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 certainly meets the requirements for high in in, in ZRO two and low in some of the um you know, key impurities like titanium and iron. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the things about this deposit is the uranium and thorium is is actually relatively low. So it appears that uranium thorium will be in the sort of three four hundred ppm range, and mm. that that's unusual now. There's a lot of higher. I mean. Uh, Thunderbird's a good example, 600 ppm. Uh, it's that product is perfectly saleable, but there are markets where people would prefer uh, lower uranium and thorium. And so I think in the end, it will be one. Of, it would it, the potential exists for it to be one of the better zircons in the market. Okay, um, I guess just to close this off, run us through the next couple of months, or maybe in the next 12 months. I know we've gone through yeah. a lot of it in the chat. But, yeah, but we can. Yeah. But I think. I think it's just really good for us. So we're we're in March now. What, yeah. Where where does next March take us? Because that does take us into first cash flow, yeah. right? And uh, what well, are... yeah, first cash flow in the in the project. Yeah. yeah. So the the way to think about that would be, you know, what what happens this year? You know, construction. You know, we're in March now. Wet season's nearly over. That's probably the key. You know, you really know where you are at the end of the wet season. That's always been one of our potential. You know, one of the one of the challenges in, in that part of the world. Um, then really uh, construction continuing uh, through till, you know, in, into the fourth quarter, but starting, you know, we're, we're, we're mobilizing operation, oper, you know, we're starting to hire the operators, you know, we'll, we'll have mining, waste mining and, and, and so on starting in the, in the third quarter. Uh, expectation is that we would be commissioning uh, staged commissioning, but commissioning in the fourth quarter, uh, and then you know in production and, and actually loading vessels in in the first quarter of next year. So certainly by March twenty four, would expect that we would have uh, received our first revenue from a customer and be you know that now a cash generating the the joint venture as a, as a cash generating business. There's obviously some other hurdles that have to be overcome before we see cash as a shareholder. Um, you have to, you know, stabilise the business and meet in certain requirements of the lenders. But, you know, we, we are effectively 12 months out from being, a, from being a, a, you know, for owning 50% of a cash generating asset. Good. And I just, again, just I know it's tough looking too far forward, but 
say for investors that have a longer term view, maybe yeah. maybe like to hold stock for five years, for example, what what can we expect? What are the growth plans? What what do you envision this company to be in, in five years' time? I mean, our, our view is that we we should certainly if you take a five year view, we would we would expect to be or are targeting to be a multi asset mineral sands player. I think continued focus on mineral sands. Our vision is you know, more than one asset. We're not obsessed with control, right partners are the right assets. You know, let's leverage other people's expertise, other people's funding where appropriate, and then have a portfolio of assets that are generating cash and cash returns and growth. So we would ultimately, what we're aiming to do is have a, you know, I, I guess you'd call it a, we would expect to be one of the larger mineral sands companies and probably a mid, a sort of mid cap mining company generating cash returns for shareholders and those cash returns growing is is where we want to be. Brilliant. Bruce, thank you for your time. Thank you.